Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm so excited to have Claire Jogla, the Assistant Director for Philanthropy for the Fulbright Association here with us today. She's going to give you some tips and tricks for chapter fundraising, which I think will be really helpful um, for this year and next year. So with that being said, go ahead and take it away, Claire. Hi, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. It's so nice to um, see you, those of you who have your cameras on and know that you are here, those of you who have them off right now. Um, as Christine shared, I'll be talking about setting and meeting chapter fundraising goals today. Um, our objective for this session is that at the end of the session, you'll know how to set a smart fundraising goal and know the steps you need to take to meet that goal. Um, I know that some of you are farther along in your fundraising, other people not so far. So I'm going to try to make sure to hit um, both the basics and a few more advanced skills for those of you who are already doing great um, fundraisings in your region. Um, in terms of culture setting, please set your microphone to mute unless you're asking a question or speaking to the whole group. Um, and then if you want to turn your camera so we can get to know you, you are welcome to do this, um, especially maybe during the Q&A session. I know that sometimes I don't like to have my camera on the whole time if I'm listening, um, but it would be great to see your faces maybe during the brainstorming session and the Q&A session at the end of the hour. Okay, agenda. First, we're going to do um, brief introductions. Um, so we're going to talk about goal setting when fundraising. Um, fundraising ideas, um, logistics in terms of fundraising. Legally, there are a few requirements for you and your and your chapter that we should definitely talk about and that you should definitely know. So that's probably the most important section. Um, we're going to do a little bit of group brainstorming. So if you have some challenges with fundraising right now, um, you're welcome to bring those to the table. And then at the end, we will do a question and answer session. I know that this session will not answer everything that you have. Um, all the questions that you have it will not meet everyone's needs. So if we get to the end of the session, you're thinking, hmm, my specific need wasn't met. Um, we are able to do individual coaching sessions. So um, please reach out to me at Claire at Fulbright.org. Claire at Fulbright.org if you would like to um, have a coaching session and learn more. Um, so introduction, this is me. Um, I did a Fulbright to Korea where I taught English. These are two of my students in 2014, 2015. Um, this was Halloween and I was dressed up as pop art. Um, it was a hit with the students, but ended up being a really stressful day because um, about all, all a thousand students at my school wanted pictures with me um, because they didn't celebrate Halloween regularly. Um, okay. That's my name. I'm Claire Jagla. Um, I advance the Fulbright Association's mission by engaging Fulbrighters and friends in our work. Um, I'm charged with meeting an annual fundraising goal. Um, so in terms of my experience in fundraising, I have um, an MBA. I also have a master's in nonprofit management. Um, I've been a fundraiser for over two years now, specifically fundraising, and have worked in nonprofit management for about the past eight years. Um, and I am also a member of the Association for Fundraising Professionals. Um, next, I would love for everyone to introduce, them, introduce themselves. In the chat box, I would like you to share the following information. Your name, your chapter, um, and why you chose to come to this session today and um, what you hope to learn from this session one or the other. So go ahead and write that in the chat box and I'm going to give everyone a little bit of time to review everyone else's answers and I'm also going to look through those myself. Excellent. Hi Arya. Um, staying up to date is great. Oh, Leslie, wonderful. I don't think I mentioned, but I actually am based in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Today I'm um, reporting live from Michigan, but I'm usually just down the street from you. Here for inspiration. I hope you leave inspired, Anne. Uh, Karen, wonderful to see you again. Um, I'm also curious to know more ch what chapters are doing. So I think we will hopefully we'll both um, fulfill that. Hi, John, nice to see you. 
Um, and John mentioned that he's excited to support chapters um, and help them refine their local fundraising efforts. Julie wants to learn more about funding opportunities. Hi, Dee Dee. Um, interested in hearing what other chapters are doing to fundraise and engage members. So a lot of us are interested in hearing from each other. So I'm gonna make sure that that's worked into the session because I don't think that's explicit in my PowerPoint. But um, as I see that that's a need for today, we'll make sure to put time, for, time in that in our group brainstorm. Marilyn reports that the developing plans for fundraising. Um, Bill says we, Oh, actually, it, can everyone make sure that their microphones are on mute? We're getting a little bit of feedback over here. Um, Bill, a new chapter in West and Mid-Michigan. Oh, I'm actually in West and Mid-Michigan today, Bill, so I'm actually near your area. Um, could use some revenue. Wonderful. Grace, wanting to learn more. Leslie, here to connect. Patrice, um, fundraising currently open to new ideas. Um, thank you so much. Those are all the ones I'm going to narrate today, but it's so wonderful that everyone chose to write into the ch tap bo chat box and share a little bit about um, why they are coming today. Okay, the next part here we have um, goal setting. So we're first going to go into setting fundraising goals. And for those of you who have been fundraising um, in the past, um, you probably know a lot about goal setting, um, but this is something that is, I think, very important and definitely a foundation for any type of fundraising that you're doing. Um, this is a picture of me and a fellow um, Fulbrighter in Korea. Um, on the, I thought the goal was fitting here um, in 2014. Okay, first we're gonna talk about SMART goals and I'm sure you've heard of these before. So this is just a review for the majority of you. But um, so whenever we set goals, we wanna make sure that they are specific. So in terms of goals for your chapter, you really do wanna set a dollar amount um, when you're fundraising and convey that goal to your peers and to your audience. Measurable, um, it, needs to, it needs to make sense for your group. It needs to not only be amount, but like something that like, oh, we're fundraising $300 for this cause. We're fundraising $300 so that we can have food at our next event. Um, it needs to be really clear to your audience. Achievable, um, this is actually something that um, I could not stress enough, the need for your fundraising goal to be something that you can actually meet. Um, it's really, um, inspiring when you meet set a goal and you actually meet it but if you set it too high or it's too it's outlandish in some way um, that really um, deteriorates from your overall funding if people don't feel like you can ever meet that goal um, relevant it needs to make sense for um, what you're doing so in terms of your chapter fundraising it should be associated with your chapter and our Fulbright mission some way so it should be some sort of service or education like that the fundraising needs to relate to your programming um, time bound and time bound um, this is also really important in terms of meeting that goal you need to have an, an end date for when you're going to stop fundraising so that's clear to the people who are giving to the people who are fundraising which is you and your um, fellow chapter members um, when it ends okay so some examples of what type of smart goals you should be setting for your chapter is something like our chapter will raise five hundred dollars by January 1st for a January chapter event. This is $80 more than we raised last year for this event. So this is um, definitely achievable because you've raised a, a, a close amount of money last year, but it's pushing yourself a little bit further. Um, it's definitely time sensitive. You know, it's going to end January 1st. You know what the fundraising money is for. Maybe you're paying a speaker fee for a January event. Um, and that adds clarity to the project. Um, a couple other examples are our chapter will raise $500 by December 1st for a regional national dis natural disaster. I will donate the first $100 myself when I plan to increase the goal if we meet it within 48 hours. Um, Pauline, this goal is um, based off of you. So thanks to Pauline in Louisiana for example number two. And then um, three, our chapter will raise $300 by May 31st for upcoming summer events. This is our chapter's first fundraiser. Um, and note the amount there, that's $300. Um, $300 I think is a good amount if you haven't fundraised before. So like making sure to set that number like low enough that it's like totally feasible and you're going to make it, but big enough that it's actually something to fundraise. 
Um, in terms of general goal setting, um, I always like to stress that during fundraising, you should be comfortable making this ask. You should be comfortable, confident, and clear. So I like to think of like the feel of an asking someone for money you should be feeling like sinking into like a soft couch. You're on the couch and you have like your cup of tea with you and they have their cup of tea. And not literally, this is more of like a figurative figurative um, metaphor for like how it should feel. If, if fundraising feels very stressful, and making this ask to someone for money feels very uncomfortable, you should probably rethink your goals and rethink what you're asking them and figure out why it's making you uncomfortable. A good ask is investing someone in something that you both care about and it should feel very warm and almost a little fuzzy. So if you're missing that warmth, if you're missing the couch, if you're missing the tea, you should really rethink about like, why am I missing this? Why do I feel so uncomfortable about this ask? Um, and I couldn't stress achievable enough. So you should always start small, even if you're just raising $100 because you haven't fund fundraised before and you're going to donate 25 yourself. You want to show a track record of success, saying that, oh, yes, I can meet this small goal. And then you move on to your bigger goal. Oh, and mission oriented, this part's really important too. And I think especially to those of you who really care about our mission at um, the Fulbright Association and living that mission at your chapter, um, this should just be, this should almost be common sense, but sometimes you forget, but mission oriented fundraising should support the mission. So it should be, um, the fundraising should continue and extend the Fulbright tradition of education, advocacy, and service. So if your fundraising isn't connected to like what we're doing in some way, if you're not raising money that's connected to our mission, you really um, don't need to be raising that money. So it's always good to reorient yourself in what the what your nonprofit, in this case, uh, the Fulbright Association does. OK. So next I'm gonna talk about um, three different goal areas. Oh, and as a quick note, um, in the, in the follow-up to this, um, you're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint um, and you're also going to get um, this PowerPoint in notes format. So if you're taking notes right now, you do not need to copy everything word for word because you'll get it word for word. And then you'll also get a reference letter for um, donors. So just I just wanna let you know that now if you're taking notes. But I split this up into three goal, goal areas. And the first one I think is the most challenging goal area for fundraising and it's um, building general chapter funds. So this is like, you, let's say you have, um, you have a bank account because of course you do, you're a chapter. Um, and you are, uh, you have like maybe $500 in this account from, from dues. And you would love to have more like $2,000 in this account so that if you need money, if you need, if you need food for an event, if you need to pay for a venue for an event, um, you are able to have that money. Um, this is really tricky because most people like enjoy giving to flashy projects, something fun, an event, um, some sort of thing where you can see the results. So this is a little bit um, harder fundraising these general funds. So the two things that I advise in terms of ideas of what you can do to raise these funds, um, the first one is to make an annual ask to all your chapter members. Um, so that something like um, when Every June, let's say you ask all your chapter members for $10, give and, and you keep the link through the email we're saving up. Um, so in terms of this, you wanna make both the ask and the action accessible. So like $10 is probably not a lot to a lot of your members. So that's like a low amount, that's good, that's accessible. And um, you also sent the link in an email. So it's also ac accessible. So all you have to do is click through there. Um, you wanna state why you need the funds and how you intend to use them. Um, also, in terms of a quick note on this, um, you want to ask people, you want to keep up your communication in whatever way that you are already communicating with your stakeholders. So if you're already communicating with your chapter members through email, continue to do that. If you're already communicating with them through Instagram, continue to do that. This should be a seamless transition from communicating to asking, making a small ask of them. Um, another um, thought for building chapter funds is making a one-time ask or an annual ask to chapter board members. Um, and this is something that if you decide to pursue this should be decided kind of as a group. Like this, this idea should be posed during a meeting. You should have a little discussion about whether this is appropriate culture for your, for your board. Would it be appropriate for all board members to give a little bit each year? 
Um, you really want to engage other people on your leadership team before making an ask like this. You don't want it to feel like, oh, um, Susan is making this ask of us. She wants us to give $50, $50 all of a sudden. It was her idea. You want to make sure this is like a group a group idea. Um, you want to make sure it's been bounced around a lot, and then you want to invest in this idea together. So what you could do is at the beginning of the term, work with other chapter leaders to set expectations about making a contribution, and then follow up with those towards the middle or the end of the term. Um, some notes, so I have a couple notes about this, and I'm gonna actually start with the second one. So in terms of this board giving, um, I can, like. When people think about fundraising, it does make a lot of people uncomfortable. And so something I want to stress too, if you're if you're doing one of these annual asks to your chapter members or to your other board members, um, I would ask that you set participation goals rather than amount per person goals. And this promotes inclusivity because sometimes different people can give different amounts. Um, at a former organization I worked for, um, some of our board members were giving $25,000 a year and other people were giving $100 a year. Um, they were on the same board and our goal was 100% giving. So it didn't matter to us that whether how much they were giving as long as 100% of people gave something to this board. Um, well, I guess it mattered in that a week. <laughs> we got a lot more income from some people and others, but in terms of meeting that goal, in terms of our group uh, dynamic, it mattered that everyone was giving. Um, and that was what was important to us. So I do suggest you do something like that if you're, if you're going to pursue one of these goals. Um, follow up to goals like this can look like um, personal thank you notes, um, thank you phone calls for larger than expected gifts, um, announcements of total amount raised and final thank yous to all chapter members. Um, so in terms of this goal, building general um, chapter funds, um, I'd like to know if anyone on this call has any experience doing this and if they would like to tell us a little bit about how it's going. Um, so if you have experience and you'd like to come off mute or maybe off video as well and tell us about this, um, now is your opportunity. You're also welcome to share at the end. If you would like to write it into the chat box while we move on to the next section, Section, you're welcome to do that as well. You're also welcome to use the chat box for questions as we go or comments as we go too. Um, feel free to use it um, as you would normally um, use, use any sort of messaging service. Okay, our second goal area is one that I think is a lot easier and this is support for a specific program. Um, in terms of giving, people love giving you just things that they can see the results for. So um, something like uh, an event um, that a bunch, let's say you are planning an event, you need $500 to make this event go off. You need, you need like, um, let's say you're trying to buy food for this event. You have a speaker, you have a space. Um, it's, it's going to be at the local university and you need $500 to pay for the food for this event. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to engage a donor of some sort. The way I put it here is leverage involve chapter members in their community, as well as local organizations and businesses. So let's say you have this event, you need $500. Um, what you should do is contact chapter members and see what their interests are. Um, something that I do um, professionally a lot is um, research people, learn about, uh, and by research, I mean a lot of the times it's sitting down with a cup of coffee and talking to someone else or even doing that over Zoom and learning about their interests. Perhaps you have a board member. Um, so let's say you're doing a, let's say you're doing a, a talk on secondary education. Perhaps you have a board member who's really interested in that. Or perhaps you have a board member who has a connection to a caterer and could get you a 50% discount on catering. Um, you want to know who the people are in your chapter, and you want to know what their connections are, how you can how you can connect their connections to our chapter, your chapter, um, and make it grow. So examples, connections to a speaker, venue, restaurant, caterer, corporate funding, financial support. 
Um, I imagine a lot of you do this already casually and don't really consider it like this is your fundraising practice, but doing things like this, figuring out what your connections are, that is fundraising. Um, getting things like this, like a speaker in a venue, if you are getting that and not paying for that, you are already fundraising. You are getting um, in-kind donations for your chapter, which is wonderful. Um, it's also good to do a research resource dive is what I'm calling this with board members once a year. So sitting down with fellow board members or fellow chapter leaders and learning what their connections are. What are they interested in? What other nonprofits are they interested in? Um, who do they want to get more engaged in your nonprofit? I know a lot of organizations I work with, they literally sit down with pens and paper once a year and have people write out um, who they'd like to get more involved. And then they follow up with the board member and those people. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that formal, but the better you can get to know your chapter members, the better you can get to know other chapter leaders, um, the more you're able to do this and the more you're able to build those resources. Um, the next option. The next thing I want to share is actually something I learned from chapters. So I know that some of you are already doing this. And I wanted to bring it up because I thought it was such a great idea for everyone to be doing. And that's to add donation options to any program registrations. So let's say you have an event, you are you have an online option to register for this event. Um, you should always have an extra box. If people are paying for this event, you should have a second box to check. If it's a free event, you should still have this box to check. Would you like to donate five dollars to support support our chapter programming? Check the check the box. Would you like to donate ten dollars to support this event? Check the box. Would you like to um, donate um, five dollars to support a young professional at this event? Check the box. Um, usually just one of those things. So don't go too wild with this, but like having one box to ask for donations is such a common practice in fundraising. And it's because a lot of people check the box. Um, I think definitely, especially as a younger professional, I sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, they're asking me for more and more money. But um, it's okay if you're a young professional like me or don't want to give to just ignore that, move on. And then the people who do want to donate will check the box though. So make sure that um, if you have an online form for that, remember you always have an opportunity to donate for that. Some tips here, once again, start small. Um, recently, I was, I'm was i on a local nonprofit board in Indianapolis for an arts education organization. And um, our um, organization, our young, non, young professionals organization raised $500 through a recent event. And the board president of the larger board came to us and asked if we'd want to throw their, um, throw the gala for the event and raise $37,000. And I thought, absolutely not. Um, but it's rem you need to remind yourself, like you need to start small and manageable, even in these events, even in these event um, gifts, like asking someone um, for a small amount of money is a lot less stress stressful. It feels more comfortable. It feels cozy. It's giving you more of that couch feeling. Um, you want it to be small. You also want to consider strain and success on local businesses with the same nonprofit I'm raising money for. We usually host our events at breweries or restaurants. And the breweries and restaurants in Indianapolis, we learned, are no longer um, giving as much as many things pro bono, like they might have donated beer to us or like food to us in the past. Um, now they're just letting us use their venue, which is still wonderful that they're letting us use a venue for free, but it really helps to know like what kind of strain the people you're talking to are under and then adjusting from there. Um, be flexible with your expectations, like as I said with the restaurant example. Um, so the restaurant did not donate any beer to us, but they let us use their space. So being flexible and knowing like, well, that if you can't give us this, this will be great. Um, and not always going in with like a clear, like this is what I want answer. Like what is plan B? Being accepting a plan B helps a lot. And then always follow up with your um, donors. I think we already talked about thank you notes and thank you calls. But things like event pictures, sending event pictures to um, donors is really helpful sometimes to show them like what the impact their event was. Posting on social media and tagging a venue or tagging a supporter if they're on social media as well is really help helpful. And inclusion in email to members, forwarding that to business, making sure that their members know what you gave to them. 
And then quickly, um, I wanted to quickly touch on prospects. Like, who, who are you asking for this money? We talked a lot about the cha your chapter members and your chapter leaders. And I, I encourage you when you're thinking about who you're making these asks to, to think about the people that you know. Think about the people who are already giving to you already in your network. Um, you want to think about your friends. You want to think about your family and your community, your Fulbright friends and community. Um, there's no magic list out there for who you should be contacting. If I had one, I would give it to you. Um, but it's really just building those connections, starting small, learning what people are capable of giving, and then growing from there. Um, the last school area, I'm going to touch on this briefly, um, but support for a local need or a nonprofit. Um, as I know that several of you are doing, um, have done fundraisers like this, um, that in which that you are fund fundraising to um, give money to a look another local pro nonprofit or another project in your area. Um, which I think is wonderful because it really um, continues that Fulbright tradition of um, giving of service. Like this is another way. Um, this is another way to serve. Um, so things that you could do to support another nonprofit. First of all, I uh, um, encourage you to offer your time and talent, such as a chapter volunteer day. Um, once again, extending that tradition of service, like the one of the best things that you can give is your time. And it also is a really inclusive activity in that like a lot of people will have time to volunteer, especially your younger professionals. Um, and it's something that you, you can do together to really team build, really build a community. Um, so I really um, suggest that you do something like a, a service day. And then the next thing is um, fundraise from chapter members to support another nonprofit. Um, I encourage you to do this as well. If there's something that your chapter is passionate about and you want to um, and you want to proceed with it, um, something that I really want to point out though is you should be clear about who is receiving the money and how. Um, an example, an example of this: um, a lot of nonprofits give receipts for tax purposes, so it might make sense for members to donate directly to that nonprofit. And you also want to report back on the amount raised and how the funds were used so that people understand um, how you're using their money. Okay. Fundraising logistics. Now this is the most important part. Okay, so all, um, full, all chapters are subordinate organizations to the Fulbright Association. And I don't mean this in a subordinate way other than the fact that um, legally chapters are subordinate organizations. And we, we are like this, so we can all be connected. And so legally, um, all chapters qualify under a group exemption um, for a 501c3 status. And this prevents all the chapters from having to seek their own 5013 status. Um, it unites us in the eyes of the IRS. Um, so it's a great thing in, in that it really simplifies the tax process for, for all the chapters and for um, um, FA National as well. Um, that's just how we're set up. Um, this slide is in orange because it's the most important one. So chapter requirements in terms of fundraising. So this is what you should be doing. Um, if you're not doing this right now, don't worry. Um, this is the time I'm telling you this is what you this is what you should be doing in terms of fundraising. And that is sending each donor a formal acknowledgement for tax purposes. Um, I linked that um, you're going to get a link to this tax letter, which is shared on a, a Google Drive, um, and you're able to download it, you're able to adapt it to fit your needs. And the um, this chap this letter is important because it shares that um, the contribution that a donor makes to your chapter is um, is tax deductible for them. So as like for the smaller donations you're getting, it's not as important because a lot of the times people who are giving ten to fifteen dollars aren't incredibly worried about the um, tax letter, this tax exemption. But as you grow your fundraising practice, it becomes a lot more important because people want record of the money that they gave um, gave to a nonprofit so they can claim it for taxes. So this is a simply um, by a tax acknowledgement letter. It's a thank you letter and it includes this really specific language. Please note that your contribution is tax deductible and that no goods or services were received in exchange for this contrib contribution. Um, so that is like the formal tax acknowledgement. And you also want to, in 
ma maintain a list of your donors and donations amounts. So very simple, just the name of the person, how much they gave, and you want to send this to the Fulbright Association in your annual report form in the case of an IRS audit. So uh, the it's actually so it's pretty simple. This this letter goes to the donor. Um, you can send it by email. You can send it by mail. Um, either is fine. And then the list of donors goes to the Fulbright Association so that when the IRS asks, asks us about giving, we can be like, OK, well, this this chapter in uh, Massachusetts got this much money from this, these donors. Um, so pretty simple. Um, but if the IRS ever wants us to verify that people gave, um, we at National need to have a list of who gave us money. Okay, next slide is um, success stories. So um, this is a point where if you have, do you have a chapter fundraising success story that you would like to share? So by success, I mean that you have raised some sort of money for some sort of thing through your chapter. Um, I would list like any, any sort of donation, any sort of fundraising as a success at this point. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor now and I'm gonna um, I was a teacher for a few years and we learned wait time, so I'm going to practice wait time. But um, I would love for a couple people to share now if they've had any fundraising success so far. I can jump in. And, and hi, this is Bob Shaw from currently in Rhode Island, but used to be in Utah. And I just want to suggest that one source of uh, support for a lot of activities is the local colleges that the Fulbright students are enrolled in. Um, in Utah, at least, all the different colleges were quite happy to donate in-kind services. If we went on a trip, they would give us sometimes a van, sometimes with a driver even. Um, if, they were, if we did a bowling event at University of Utah, they would donate the, uh, the bowling fees and things like that, because they, they felt that it was important um, to support the Fulbright students they had. And um, you know, the three major colleges there that all had Fulbright students we're quite happy to donate uh, typically in-kind services for our various activities. And that, that's been less true here in Rhode Island, but we're, but we're working on that. Wonderful, thanks, um, thanks Bob for sharing. Um, I see that William Timpson's raising his hand. Gotta unmute. Hey, thanks, thanks for uh, organizing this. You know, something that I don't think Fulbright talks much about, but I have been a huge benefit of connecting through Rotary to global grants. So for faculty who are involved in projects, who get a Fulbright, uh, and you want to continue that work and build on it, Fulbright doesn't allow a second award in that same location, but other organizations might. And I have had three global grants from Rotary to build exactly on what we started with Fulbright. They're significant, they go to the host country. Um, so there's a, there's a partnership there that I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, Rotary has, has uh, partnered with Peace Corps and it seems to me, it's obvious to me that it, there should be a partnership with uh, Fulbright as well. So think about that. Oh, wonderful. I love that both of these examples, um, William and Bob, they're both something that's a little bit different than like specifically asking for money. So in-kind donations, you're getting things for free grant access, you're getting a lot of things, a lot of resources and time and energy that's not necessarily coming in money, but both of these things are fundraising. Both of these count as fundraising um, and both of these things really improve your, um, your organization. So these definitely count. You are both definitely fundraisers. And it, it also, I'm thinking of that as a selling point to recruit new members because university faculty, especially at research universities under huge pressures to get grants. And so Fulbright counts, but if you can build on it, that adds even more. So here's a way I'm gonna to talk to faculty and grad students about uh, the benefits of, of coming into the organization. Wonderful, William. I love how you're connecting that to the um, recruitment efforts as well. Um, I see that Leslie wrote into the chat box, you haven't started engaged in fundraising um, since your time that you started. And I also want to verify that you're still a good chapter leader and you're still doing great work if you haven't done fundraising yet. Um, a lot of, especially if you're, if you're running any events of sort and you're not actually doing formal fundraising for these, 
um, you're still doing great leadership. Um, you're still getting people engaged and you're still volunteering your time for something that's important to you. Um, so kudos to all of those of you who are doing hard work that doesn't necessarily look like asking for money in any way. Um, your work is still hard and it's still important. Um, Patrice from Louisiana, would you please share? Um, hi everyone. Um, Claire, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, Claire was extremely helpful when we decided to try our first fundraising uh, event here in Louisiana. We're a new chapter and following uh, Ida hurricane coming through, we decided that as a chapter, we wanted to try and do something to help communities in South Louisiana. So we opened a GoFundMe with the intent of there had been a specific request for t-shirt and sock drive, um, as well as trying to um, purchase uniforms for children. There were a list of 900 children that needed uniforms to return to school. So we started a GoFundMe page with a goal of $500. Um, we very quickly uh, raised $2,000. Um, on that GoFundMe page, followed by um, a request just this past week from a small Bayou community that really was receiving very little help that we went to visit to deliver supplies to put on a, a Thanksgiving feast for their community to um, create a sense of community again and a moment to kind of for the community to come together so we're in the process of putting that together right now and we extended our fundraising with an additional goal, asking people to sponsor Thanksgiving meals at $15 a plate. Um, we are almost at $7,000 um, total from first from when we started to now, very unexpectedly, um, great surprise. We're, we're extremely excited about it. So on November 22nd, we will be making a work day where we're partnering with some other organizations to pull off this large event to feed 400 people in the small little bayou community that is hours away from where um, most of us are. And so we are gathering volunteers and we have partners uh, like culinary arts programs at a university that is going to jump in and help with the cooking and the food safety and um, so there's a lot of pieces, but we've been very successful with that. Um, that service project has now turned into a three-part project that we are um, really excited about doing. Wonderful, Patrice. Uh, fantastic work. Um, I first of all want to acknowledge like the amount of time and energy it must uh, it must have taken to do that amount of work. So thank you and thank you for doing it with our Fulbright community. I know it's not hard and I know it's time consuming to do projects like that. So um, wonderful to hear you share about that. Um, two things I want to pull out about um, your story too are that you were very specific with your goal when you started. We're trying to raise $500 you met that goal, you change it to $2,000. Later, you are also making a specific ask. Do you want to give $15 for this dinner? So it's clear where the money's going. It's clear what the ask is. And those are the part, parts of your um, fundraising that made this appealing to people who want to give. I also love that you connected um, so much service in with this, as I think it really um, messages that all type of time and talent is important. Thanks, Claire. Um, can I also just add that I would, I agree with what you said that I think the reason this has worked is because it's something that was very, very easy to ask for. Like that, like it's enjoyable to ask people to sponsor a meal or sponsor meals for families or give socks and t-shirts. And it's been enjoyable to go down and take the photos and share photos back with donors. And I find that every time I take photos and I post them, more people give. Um, so, so the things that you're saying, you know, we're new at this. It's the first time we've done it, but I, I guess this is proof that it's, I mean, exactly what you're saying is working for us. So thank you for the input. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, also, so 
Patrice and I, she reached out to have a small coaching session when she was planning this. And first of all, all these ideas were Patrice's ideas, but the way that we were able to bounce ideas back and forth on each other, that Patrice was able to gain momentum um, early on. Um, and I'm glad I could help you with that in that way, Patrice. And I'm open to helping anyone else who needs that type of help too. So once again, my name is, my email is claire at fulbright.org. But if you want to reach out and have a conversation, you have some ideas and aren't sure how to implement them. Um, I do have the time and energy to help you implement this ideas. Um, we're going to move on to the group brainstorming session right now. We will have more time to, for people to share during our question and answer. So for the next, the next um, nine minutes are going to be group brainstorming. And then the next, um, then the final 10 minutes will go into question and answer. But um, this is for those of you who may have come to the session because you have a fundraising need. Like maybe you need money for something. Maybe you want money for something. Um, would you like to share with, and the, the opportunity is for us to share um, ideas with you back. So if you have, if you would like to come on camera or write into the chat box, your need, and we will all think about that for a minute. And then we'll um, see who wants to share their ideas for that. I'm actually going to um, stop sharing a second so we can see everyone's um, box face in the face and boxes on the screen. So you can have your camera on, you can have your camera off. But um, if you would like to share a fundraising need in your chapter, now is your time. Excellent. I'm going to read your note of aloud, Darlene. Um, I wish I'd heard this before I did a presentation to the Rotary Club in Tampa. It was 2010. They asked if I needed anything for my work at the Child Care Center in South Africa. I had no idea it was possible to get money. Next time I'll know. Um, wonderful that next time you'll know, Darlene. I think a lot of the times um, I can be pretty hard on myself. I like making a misstep in fundraising. And so one of the things I want you to also know as you get into this is you're going to make a misstep. You are probably going to offend someone at some point doing something that was culturally insensitive to someone else and not know it. Um, so so my advice for you in those moments is to apologize and move on or know that you didn't get money in 2010 and maybe go back to the Rotary Club this year for another presentation. I too have done Rotary Club presentations, so it's, it's they're probably still a thing. Um, it's not too late, Darlene, to go back and give them another presentation about your work. Is anyone else interested in either sharing a fundraising challenge that they're having recently or the, uh, or um, share a success story with your chapter? Okay, might great. Time, well, it's <laughs> might be time to might be time to call on somebody. Uh. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about cold calling in the study. <laughs> Um, for two years, I taught um, middle school in Texas, and then a third year, I taught um, students in Korea, and actually cold calling was like the Korean students' worst nightmare. There was nothing you could do worse to a student than to call on them when their hand wasn't raised. Um, Alex, I see your hand is raised. Great. Thank you, Claire. Uh, this was very informative, and I wanted to raise a question because it's an interest that I have been exploring with some of the board members. Uh, I'm president of the South Carolina chapter and we've been having conversations exploratory and maybe there is some wisdom in the group here uh, regarding the idea of um, uh, establishing a student scholarship fund uh, where we would raise funds from amongst ourselves and friends of the, of the chapter and, and others in our networks throughout to um, uh, make supplemental uh, fellowship awards to students, um, prioritizing uh, Fulbright student uh, awardees who may have that additional need that the grant has limitations to provide or things like that. Uh, as well as uh, promote international education and, and mobility, uh, especially among students who, who can't. So it would not be exclusive is the current thought to the Fulbright student grantees, 
but uh, you know that'll be our, our first consideration. So, so that is where we are. Uh, I wonder if anyone else from the other chapters has any insight or wisdom to share regarding this. Uh, we have not yet. Um, I have included this uh, as an agenda item in the last two board meetings that we've had uh, this year. Uh, we have not had enough time to fully develop this concept uh, to the extent that we feel comfortable to get in on the work, uh, but it is in the working. And I'm excited to say that a few uh, board members uh, have expressed enthusiasm saying, uh, I'm ready to write the first check for it, uh, which is exciting to, to hear. So, but I wanted to present this as a question, as an idea, are others doing anything like this? have tried, maybe have lessons to, to share as we venture into, into this journey. So thank you. Wonderful, passing it to um, Pat Hutchinson. Yes, hi, thanks Claire and thanks Alex. Uh, it's really interesting that you brought this up and I know Claire has just been speaking to one of our board members, um, John Specchio, who recently came to me, I'm the president of the New Jersey chapter and he, uh, he has a family foundation in memory of his daughter who passed away when she was in college in Virginia. But as a New Jersey board member, he was interested in seeing whether their family foundation could support New Jersey Fulbrighters and other New Jersey students who might need some help. I didn't know how to go about this. I'm, I'm sort of new at everything that we're doing here. But uh, um, Christine Oswald sent us to Claire and Claire has been talking to John so that's really one of the reasons I'm here. I'm very excited to hear you know, some ideas about how we proceed with this. And perhaps we'll be able to talk to Alex too about how this is going along. Yeah, I, it's wonderful to hear that both of you are pursuing some similar ideas, which actually gives me more confidence in the strength of the idea too, that, that you both came up with this independently. In terms of um, tax requirements, um, Alex, um, and I already told Pat, Pat this via email, um, you do need, you just need to make sure you're giving um, letters of recognition to the people who give to you and keeping a list of them for tax purposes. And then also um, you'll need to let us know if you give out money greater than $600 so we can follow up with the W-9 with the scholarship recipient. Um, other than those very specific requirements, which are required um, by the IRS, um, you are free to go forth and conquer with this. So um, I'm very excited to talk more as you need, Alex, and also very excited to see how you implement this in your chapter. Great. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Okay, any other questions um, or fundraising ideas that you would like to share with your peers at this time? I actually would like to just hop on and say something. Um, so I encourage all chapter leaders to keep an eye on our national calendar. I'm constantly putting um, different event descriptions from other chapters on there. And that's a really good way to get ideas for events, for fundraising initiatives. And I also encourage you to reach out to those chapter leaders hosting these events and collaborate with them. Um, I know people are always willing to share ideas, share best practices, um, and you might even co-sponsor event, an event at some point after you connect. Um, so just keep that in mind, keep the, the calendar in mind. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up here since it seems like we're ready for the end. Um, I'm gonna once again, share my email address in the chat box. So if you have questions or concerns um, or want some private coaching on an idea that you have, um, you're welcome to reach out and we will schedule a time um, to chat more about that. Um, Christine is following up um, with a um, email with the PowerPoint uh, handout and also that important IRS tax letter that you need to be giving donors when you get donations. Question. Uh, yes. Um, I was the first, first Fulbrighter back into Burundi after the Civil War. And um, 
I don't know if anyone, anyone else has followed into that country. It's very poor. Um, they're making great strides, our workers on sustainable peace building. But the question is, um, how does the Fulbright Association connect to overseas projects? They are working closely with us to, to build something. And I think there could be opportunities. Uh, young people want to study um, their faculty. I don't know, is that an option? Hmm, I might actually pass this question to John, who might have more context about that. John, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we have in the past, on occasion, supported international development uh, projects. Um, the, uh, on occasion, this has been connected to our travel program. Uh, so they uh, go to a country in Central Africa, for example, raising money for to fight deforestation and women's rights and the like. Uh, so what we try to do is connect this to something else that's going on so that it's not just a, a one-off because of course there are thousands if not millions of of worthy causes overseas that we could support uh, and then we might lose a lot of focus and uh, you know and and then and lose a bit of a sense of mission but i think that to, to claire's general point uh, and to patrice's experience if it energizes your chapter to raise money for a specific project going on overseas that has drawn a lot of interest locally or uh, is a particular passion of a, a set of uh, uh, members, I think it's fine. I, I, I think that whatever we feel is an extension of our mission for public service, which would cover a lot of this stuff, I think that the, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I would also just encourage you when you do that to share that experience, share it with Claire, share it with Christine um, so that we can share it with the wider community. Uh, when our chapters experience success or do something meaningful like raise money for, um, you know, for saving the rainforest, um, let's, let's celebrate that. That's a, that's a great thing to recognize. That's a, that, in general, that would be a, a piece I would only add to Claire's terrific presentation, which is about recognition. So let's let's celebrate these things. Let's celebrate these achievements. If you're fundraising for a, a local event, that's great. If you're if you're just adding more resources to your chapter's um, coffers, and therefore you can uh, do more programming, that's great. Let us know those things, not just because. We need to know that for tax purposes, but because we want to celebrate it and hold that up. Right. Great. Thanks. Now, Claire, if I could have just one more minute, um, I, I would just say uh, for those of you who have been around for a really long time, this workshop may have been a bit of a surprise to you, uh, because in the past, uh, the organization has not been very clear with chapters about their ability to fundraise. In fact, there has been messaging that we've actually discouraged that in the past. Uh, it should be obvious that we're, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> Claire is here, and we're offering this workshop because we we want to empower you and give you the resources and the opportunities to raise money to advance your mission and to strengthen your chapter. And we want to be supportive of that. And that's why we're doing this. So if that's for many of you, that seems like, wow, that's a change. That's because it is a change. Um, and uh, we're excited to offer a sort of a new vision for the collective benefits of fundraising uh, from our incredibly talented and generous community. I think we'll go ahead and leave it at that today. Um, you're welcome to follow up um, with me, Christine, or John via email or phone call to the Fulbright office if you have more questions. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, it was a joy to talk to you today. I am very excited about um, your future as fundraisers and learning more about your projects. So please do keep in touch. Um, as John said, we, we would love to share them and we hope that you feel empowered um, to raise money. And if you don't yet, um, call us up and we will help you too. 
um, take care of everyone. Um, have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.